going to run into this person discussion of Mikael in this Stanford's exhibition, uh, Recollection uh, of Our Memories, uh, which has been on show here at Spark now since the late October. Uh, my name is E.J. Dahl. I'm an associate professor of architecture at uh, uh, the Department of Architecture and Built Environment at the Edinburgh University. Uh, and I will moderate the discussion here. Uh, we here have, of course, Mikke Elastin de Stefald, and uh, we are happy and glad to have two, uh, two of them and Valstein with us here. Perhaps you can tell us who you are, Michaela, to start <laughs> this is um, a discussion. Yes, uh, okay, I'm, uh, so I am the artist of the exhibition. Um, I have a background in architecture and even at also at Lund University. Um, way back, uh, and also a background in, uh, in design from the Netherlands. And uh, since um, the last uh, four years now, I've been working um, with my own practice uh, as an artist uh, based in Stockholm. Great to have you here. Thank and you. Uh, Tove, who are you? Yes, my name is Tove Dumovatsen. I'm an architect. Uh, I work in Sweden now, but I used to work in Paris for a very long time. I used to work in Paris for, for about 15 years, and I've been working at the city of La Fritte in Paris. So I have a quite special relation to the city. And uh, I know Katia's work through the collective collection that she made in 2019, which was part of the Young Swedish form. So you have local knowledge uh, of, of, of the place of the Interest, at least. Yeah. <laughs> so great to be here this afternoon. Um, so Spark, where we are sitting at right now, is a collaborative platform uh, with the purpose of strengthening the interface between architecture, uh, research, art, and social advancement through exhibitions and lectures. Uh, and the aim is to promote artistic processes in urban and development by activating intersections between art, architecture, urban design, and landscape architecture. Uh, Sparks aims at, at exhibiting works that provoke critical discourse on current city building to explorative, experimental, trans, and interdisciplinary practices. And uh, we collaborate with the Department of Architecture uh, at the University and with Scania. Uh, we are supported by Kultur at the City of Malmö, and we are proud to collaborate with a lot of, of, uh, of um, galleries that are close to us here in this beautiful uh, gallery row of Malmö, particularly mo Molecule Gallery is a great collaboration partner for us, so I have to mention that. Um, so Spark operates due to this specific mission, and uh, in, this, in this exhibition that we've had in our month, Michaela showcases uh, some of her work on reproduction and archival processes in the age of the internet, as well as our growing relationship to digital landscapes and the ties to public life. Uh, and here at Spark, uh, it is a collective trauma of the monument in the structure of Notre Dame in Paris that has been under scrutiny. So I'd like, I'd like to kickstart this discussion by asking both of you briefly to reflect upon, I mean, how would you, say, how would you think about uh, uh, this exhibition, how it responds to, to Spark mission, to the mission of Spark? And perhaps we can have a start because you have been working here and then to a good. Well, as, as far as I have understood Spark, uh, it is, um, it is that, I mean, you, you all come from architecture, but I uh, have this uh, interest in, in sort of architecture that is not the classical architecture, mm -hmm. let's say. Um, and there I think we overlap. Uh, I, of course, with my background in architecture, also has had that um, interest and component always in my works um, somehow, and somewhere there we meet, I think. In me not having been, having been trained as an architect, but never actually worked as an architect, and then you working a lot with architecture as a design to reach uh, something else. And I think maybe I'm that something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
So you, so you, you really dwell upon this uh, intersection between architecture and something else, and you try to explore that. Mm -hmm. uh, Tue, what, what do you think? Yeah. As, as I see it, uh, the Spark Gallery, it's uh, it's about architecture, but it's not representations about uh, of architecture in the classical way that we used to see it in architectural exhibitions. It's more about explorations of what space can be, uh, different tools of representing architecture, and yeah, exploring and finding out what architecture can be in a way, and using a lot of new tools. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, I haven't seen Michaela's uh, exhibition now on site because it's in Malmö and I'm in Stockholm. But I, uh, I think yeah, all the exhibitions of Spark that I've more read about than seen in space all explore this a kind of new landscape where where architecture can be discovered in a new way, new spaces, new spatial explorations. And uh, it really has a, a space to fill, I think, because we need to, to discuss that more. What can architecture be? What kind of spaces are architecture in society today? Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. I think that's quite right on, actually, <laughs> what we <laughs> to, to do here. Um, uh, exploring new, 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 new spatial explorations and trying to understand what space can be in the Temporary. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I've been sitting here and, uh, and a few times now, uh, you know, interacting with the public here and uh, listening to what people say, and I've been thinking about the exhibition myself. Um, and two things that I, I've been kind of thinking about that attracts me a lot with this exhibition is, is, is uh, and perhaps we, we can let the conversation kind of sort of start to circle around these two topics. One has to do with, of course, the tools. I mean, the disciplinary tools, the tools we use in architecture to explore some new, 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 new spaces. And here is working on the intersection between automation and kind of craftsmanship and the tradition of craft. And this is a super interesting intersection that can be, we, can, we could, you know, host a, or launch a PhD seminar. It's, you know, it has a lot of different directions. We could definitely evolve something through that. But also one thing that I also think is really interesting is how the structure of trauma is kind of becoming a generative tool. Mm -hmm. how, 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 how a catastrophe like, like, the, like the Notre Dame burning down becomes something generative and, you know, and proposing new directions in, uh, in, in architecture. And then, but I'd like to start there because I mean this is a catastrophe, right? But this is a, a, a public trauma. This church can start to to, uh, to to be burning, and I thought in a biting up here, I thought about my my work. I I worked with Lewis Woods many years ago, obviously before he passed away, and and for Lewis, the the, uh, the the catastrophe was kind of a fundamental dis disruption of, of the normalization space. I mean, he could find in the catastrophe kind of the, the moment of disruption where value systems and normalizing processes were kind of interrupted where, where I identify gaps of, of, uh, of innovation and, and explore new, new kind of value systems, new processes. And how can we think about the Notre Dame uh, burning down in this sense? I mean, and, I've had people here, I mean, none of us has really know exactly what's going on with Notre Dame right now. Oh, I think uh, Clement knows. <laughs> <laughs> He's here in the audience. Uh, well, uh, in, in, in a way for architecture, what has been decided by the president is to uh, reconstruct in the same uh, manner, with the same materials as well, uh, as it was uh, originally. Uh, so the authentic way was uh, privileged uh, in front or opposite to the um, to the architect uh, contemporary architectural oh, sorry contemporary architectural gesture, but um, the contemporary will be included in the um, in the design of the 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 the, the inside of the Notre Dame. So um, I think the the signature of uh, contemporary artists would be included 
more into uh, the the design insight. So the interior will transform somehow. Yes, uh, they will. Uh, for the altar, for example, it has been crushed by the um, by the, the the roof, and so the altar and part of the uh, uh, liturg liturgical um, objects will be reshaped and remade for um, by by new artists. Hmm. That is uh, the kind of compromise they try to find uh, between what is the meaning of this. Uh, place in in terms of techniques, in terms of history, in terms of everything, but also in terms of feeling, and um, and it was decided on the higher level and sphere of the state by the president himself, but also by the architects. They all decided uh, to to privilege this way instead of uh, building a new a new architecture. Mm. So you're more ready to be included in this process. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, how would you tackle that? How I would tackle yeah. that? But I'm not an architect. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but working with the interior space, try to think about, I mean, uh, reusing those pieces that are transforming them in the processes that you have been demonstrating. Could you see yourself operating? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, my starting point is always in this, uh, in this sort of, it's not an archive in the way that it's uh, being preserved, but in, uh, like a collection of, of records of, of um, a collective memory. So I think in that sense, it could be very, very interesting to work with, with, um, with a space that was once uh, something very valuable uh, for many, many people and that's now uh, destroyed and then to add something new that still has the memory of, of the old um, former uh, would be very interesting for sure. Mm. To sort of in something new still honor, let's say, the, the previous version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there is something there, and I also believe that in your work, I mean, there's a generative aspect, there's a, there is a, a, a kind of interpretation of the records being made through all of these samplings, right? And in there, but it, it, it suggests something else uh, than just a pure re restoration. Mm -hmm. in your, I mean, that's how I can read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, uh, for me, what is interesting or important with my work is, uh, although they might look quite automated, like I uh, call them, uh, automation sort of make it sound like there was never any human involved, <laughs> but it's in fact the complete opposite in my case, because I, this, I see my work as, as my work, but also the work of, of 38,000 people. <laughs> That uh, share their their images. So uh, yeah, I think there's a it's a very important aspect that it's all these people mm -hmm. included. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think so too, of course. And you have a sample, I think 38,000 photos mm -hmm. taken by individuals of mm -hmm. the church burning down. Uh, wow. actually no, it's not well also, uh, but I selected uh, during the hours from the moment the first picture that was uploaded um, during the fire uh, until the moment that we knew that uh, the fire was under control. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a few hours in between where we didn't know what would happen, we didn't know how far it would go, uh, would we have the church at all at, at the end of this or would it all disappear? Uh, and in that moment, there was, of course, a lot of uh, images of the fire uh, itself, but there was also uh, the majority, I would say, of the images were of people that wanted to share their memories of, of the cathedral, of their visits from earlier. Um, sort of, I think, when, when, the, when the original was threatened and we didn't know what would happen, and, then, then the copies or the representations that 
people had collected over the years uh, became more important to them. They wanted to share it for, for some sort of reason. Uh, and so I have focused a lot on those images, actually, that were not of the fire itself, but of people's memories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, tens of thousands of photos taken by individual people uh, of either, of either rep rep representing the memory of a, of a, of a monument mm -hmm. uh, and the personal kind of attachment to that monument, or, uh, I mean, re registering this monument on fire. Exactly. So it really represents some kind of trauma for a lot of different people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A mourning process almost that was happening at the same time. Yeah, as, yeah. As it was really happening. Yeah. yeah, and then you sample all these images uh, and you and you uh, and you explore the outcome of this sampling through models and and and, uh, and new kind of images. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are thinking about them. This goes out out both I think to Tuve and to and to and to you. Uh, and also to our friend here, I guess. <laughs> and Maybe we should uh, present, since now uh, I kind of included you a little bit in the talk. Uh, <laughs> Clement is, uh, or do you want to present it or should I? Yeah, well, actually I, I am working as an intern, not as a, as a pure uh, searcher, but as an intern uh, to the scientific workshop. So I'm working uh, in, in the field of anthropology since we um you have seven groups uh for the restoration of notre dame on one on each uh, material so wood uh, stone glasses and each one of them is specialized in two parts the one is for restoration the second one is for analysis and um so my um field is more the affect so the emotions uh and the we we, we launched um, a scientific uh, work on the um, collecting of each kind of mobilization uh, through uh, the um, this crisis, which was the uh, heritage crisis of Notre Dame. So we try to interpret uh, each kind of mobilization uh, through the lens of uh, heritage theory and, and anthropology as well. Uh, so we were very interesting in in the in the parallel that. Um, Michael is, is, is launching as well, because it's, uh, I think, the kind of embodiment of what we're trying to do as, uh, as we collect information and, and, and as we try to figure it out. Hmm. Well, great, great to have you on board. You already have insights into the process. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking, I mean, on the Spark website, you explain this work as a, as a representation of collective uh, grief. But I mean, what about all these individuals? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it also as a, as a representation of the grief of each and every one of these 30,000 people. I mean, how yeah, do you think sure. about the relationship between, or how should we think about the relationship between the individual and the collective in your work? Well, the way I see it, uh, yes, I have collected 38,000 images and and I think there are <laughs> the same amount of reasons for why people want to share their, these images. Uh, while I, I collect them, I have also, um, not all, but I have read a lot of the captions also uh, and there are so many different stories. Like, someone got engaged here 10 years ago, or someone uh, used to walk past uh, this cathedral every day when they did a semester in Paris, or all these uh, very individual little stories. Um, and so, of course, if you look at each image, they are very personal. Mm -hmm. um, but I think when you start looking at all these images together, you also start seeing patterns. And I think that's where we see it some kind of commonness between them. Um, so, for instance, that's also how I ended up with certain fragments of, of the cathedral in here. Um, for instance, the facade, of course, being photographed a lot by a lot of people um, that sort of connect that with their visit to Notre Dame. Uh, or the spire, of course, that became more of a 
more important and shared much more over time. Because I, and I started the collecting um, in the beginning of the fire uh, when we didn't know what would happen, that, that there was a risk that this fire would not survive. Sort of. But then towards the end, of course, when, when it fell, um, it's a, it was more and more common to share images of, of the fire. So uh -huh. uh, you start to see this kind of patterns, and then when when brought it, when it's brought all together, then you see, I think, some sort of collectiveness in it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, the sparrow was really that was when that one fell down. It was really dramatic. I mean, too, but do you remember what you did when the sparrow fell fell through the roof? Yes, well, I, I think the fire of Notre Dame is kind of one of these moments where we know where we were. There are a few of these traumatic moments in, in contemporary history. We all know where we were with the Twin Towers on the 11th of September. A lot of people remember uh, where they were when uh, not, they heard that Notre Dame was on fire. Uh, there are a few moments like that, and I so I knew I was at work in the afternoon when I heard about the fire at the first time in the afternoon, and I started. I was very touched by it, and now before this talk, I was thinking, the collective memory. Why is Notre Dame so important? Right, thirty thousand people feel very invested in this building. Apparently, uh, it's been. It took a hundred years to build. It was built in the 13th century, so it's been there for a long time. It's not. It hasn't been a static building. It's been a, a central building and a building of power uh, for many different representations of power. Of course, over the Catholic Church, and then uh, during the French Revolution, it was uh, a lot. Was it was pilled? I mean, people were taking artwork, and the the clocks were melted down. It was a symbol of power. Uh, so it was kind of taken over. And then uh, Napoleon got crowned in this building. It's kind of re-empowered by another type of power. And, uh, and then Victor Hugo wrote a story called Notre Dame de Paris. And it's uh, Notre Dame de Paris or the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And it has kind of entered a collective storytelling. And a lot of people, it's been represented in films, in artwork, in, in illustrations. You can kind of feel that you've been on the roof among the gargoyles because that's the kind of illustration that you've seen looking out of a Paris from the rooftops. Very few people have done it, but very many people can identify with being on the rooftops and looking out of Paris and being with the gargoyles. So it's kind of, it's an... Uh, it kind of provokes imagination and uh, also, so I think it's kind of part of a collective storytelling and a worldwide storytelling through this, mm -hmm. through this uh, work of literature and then films. And, and then there's the Disney version, which is a complete different version than the Victor Hugo book, but it still kind of entered our collective memory. So we kind of have a, a relation to the building that is part of a collective storytelling as well. And I think that also triggers a, a relation. So when something happens to it, it's also the most visited monument in France. There's more than 12 million people every year came to Notre Dame to visit it. Uh, and that's a lot of people over time who's been there and have this memories of coming in and it's uh, the sound of the building was amazing. Uh, it was an acoustic environment that was just, uh, uh, it kind of made you quiet and calm. So this, I think it represents a lot to many people and you're afraid of losing it, even if you haven't been there, which is very interesting. <laughs> so what's this symbol of something? And what is it a symbol of? And then... Uh, no, I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely nothing. Due to that, to that explicit strength as a monument, it really, I mean, I, everyone is, is recognized himself in these works, I think. I mean, myself, I've been speaking to quite a few people about the spiral specifically, but, which is really an up, upward pointing kind of a straight, it's, it's, it's striving to get, you know, towards a life like Gothic. It really brings, I think, Gothic tradition with it, and then the design and the space of the spiral. Yet in this in this interpretation, it sounds like it's falling down, it's melting. And I think 
to me, that's really a strong, strong way of, of, of it, it's a generative approach using the destruction uh, of something, uh, of you know something that is captured through memories, but you know, to make point to something new. And that's why I'm so interested in thinking about what I mean. How can we take the next step here? How would you? How will you take this? Oh, I'm gonna make so many more sculptures. <laughs> <laughs> I have made a, a massive archive with 38,000 images. I'm gonna continue. <laughs> I've only just started. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, you you describe it as something that happens, like uh, the destruction is uh, in creating something new. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for me, I mean, it's an important point. I think that. For me, these these sculptures they are a materialization of a, a sort of growing uh, documentation or a growing. Uh, I like to call it an archive, but it, I know it's not an archive, but like archiving the, um, because because as the, as the cathedral was sort of being destroyed, um, that that collection of images grew very, mm -hmm. it was already growing, uh, of course, before, uh, all the time, with the tourists uh, taking, uh, taking every day a few photos, and sort of, but it really, it really grew so, so fast in those hours. Uh, and so for me, I think these, these uh, sculptures, they are uh, showing something that is growing mm -hmm. more than something that's being destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that to me that's a wonderful part of them. I mean, the intersection between the individual and the collective in the in the representation and how you through the sampling and the and the photogrammetry is kind of pointing to a transformative action. I mean, act, activates a transformative process of what this architecture is and can be. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of, in, of interpretations in this. I think that's. I mean, everyone's been here has had their own. Stories mm -hmm. uh, relating to Notre Dame, and that's you know everyone is saying, oh, what is happening there, right? Oh, yeah. I, I had no idea. I'd be Paris. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. But it's uh, I think the uh, the sculptures they don't they're not nostalgic in the way they're not trying to re represent what was, and in that way they also open up for imagination of what can be. And I think what was really really um, impressive after the when the roof had fallen the spire had fallen and the roof was going down was the investment in collective imagination it's like what can a cathedral be for the 22nd century it's like in a hundred years time if we take the same time to build a cathedral again what can it be what can it become and there were so many architectural proposals my from architects and people that are not architects at all, but that wanted to reinvest Notre Dame. And what can it be a symbol of if we can make it a new symbol? What do we want to symbolize? What do we want this cathedral to be or become? And I think that was this kind of huge investment in imagination of what can be. It was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, all the, I was, Got kind of addicted to looking at images of what what people imagine and some things you think about what well, this is completely crazy can ever become and some others were just like opening up and and then it uh, then in july the the french government decided that it has to be as before uh, which is one decision that could be taken so it's it, with it, this investment in imagination i think it was fabulous and i think your sculpture is open for imagination and that makes them very rich Exactly, that's exactly where I was heading also. And I was thinking about, I mean, what could this be in the meantime? I mean, it's a construction site now or a site of restoration, but could it be something else? You know? Could we rethink the concept of the cathedral? Mm -hmm. could, your, could your works help us doing that? I hope so. What do you think of that? Should it, should it be, should it be restored? <laughs> well, I was, I mean, this is a, a, like a very small. Uh, Part of this, but I, I was I visited the uh, Notre Dame a few now maybe a couple of months ago, and I was very amazed actually by the support structure that was built uh, to sort of support the cathedral 
during the restoration because I also think that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of like wooden uh, structure that was built to, to hold uh, the end of the arches that would, what were not anymore supported by the, by the roof. And this was also incredible. <laughs> um, it's just a small uh, uh, side note to what you were saying. But, but no, I think that's a very interesting <laughs> side note. I mean, I'd love to see that. Yeah, I can show you. I took many minutes. <laughs> sure, <yeah. laughs> um, and I mean, the structure has been, or you know, the structure and decay in these kinds of processes have been used as creative matter for multiple artists. And I was thinking about the, uh, for example, Gordon Anna Clark uh, and Robert Smith, so they explicitly work with destruction and decay um, uh, in their in their words, um, and uh, uh, they had a very, it's a very specific aesthetic to their, if you look at Lorna Clark's pieces, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, all the way from his early work, with, with there was explicit focus on decay through his more works of and destruction. There was an aesthetic attached to it, also Smithson's aesthetic. Your aesthetic, I mean, how are you thinking about aesthetics here? I mean, your pieces are very, they are very clean, they are whitish, they look like they are kind of uh, frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Manaclaw would perhaps have this in one dripping down, disappearing, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. but your one is, is fixed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious to think, to, to, to talk a little bit about aesthetics. I mean, how do you think about aesthetics? Um, what do these represent? Well, for me, I think it's nice that you say that they look frozen because for me that could be what it is. Um, because my my departure is always this um, this kind of informal archive that I keep talking about, which is in this case Instagram, uh, which is a medium that is in constant flux, uh, it's constantly changing, constantly uploading and taking down and up and down. Uh, and uh, it is also at the same time massive, you know, 28,000 images a day in a few hours, it's a, it's a lot. Uh, and so for me, these sculptures, but also sculptures that I've done before, has, uh, the way I've seen it is that I, I kind of take a snapshot of, of that medium at this moment. So for a few hours, Instagram with this geolocation looks like this, and I freeze it so that we can Kind of, and I make it material, uh, so so we can stop and look at it without it changing constantly, mm -hmm. and walk around it and actually reflect on it mm -hmm. in a way that would be very difficult to do with such a big image mm -hmm. archive. Mm -hmm. So for me, that, that is really what I what I try to freeze. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. well, that's nice. It's the moment. Freezing a moment in time, you get 38 different, 38,000 different interpretations of something. That mm -hmm. signifies a contemporary kind of uh, uh, diversity of, of, of kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and you do freeze that moment. Um, could you, could you, would you be interested in, in kind of working with something that, that uh, mirrors this process of flux? Um, uh, well, yeah, I have had also thoughts of working. I mean, uh, now I have chosen to really like uh, materialize them and treat them, but uh, it is also, of course, possible to to work more. Um, let's say that they actually change over time with the archive, mm -hmm. um, which would be a, a very complex. Uh, digital process that I don't think I could handle myself, but uh, that could be a very interesting uh, uh, thing. One of the first uh, projects I did on this uh, topic, which is the one that Tova was relating to earlier, um, was of an exhibition space. Um, and, and there I thought it was also kind of interesting how the visit, it was, uh, for people who don't know, it was a um, uh, images taken in the room uh, of the Louvre where uh, Mona Lisa is hanging. Uh, and uh, of course, very clear example of 
people walking into a space photographing something very specific and then perhaps leaving. Um, and, uh, and there I thought it was kind of interesting to see also how uh, the visitor of a museum or of a space uh, got a sort of, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, uh, but like a dog's job, uh, a little bit like deciding what's important, what should um, be allowed to, to continue into my work. Um, because what was photographed there was what uh, sort of survived into my version. Uh, and so uh, there I think it would have been interesting to, to make the visitors of that space aware of what they were doing collectively online. Mm -hmm. That by them walking in and photographing only Mona Lisa results in the fact that there's almost only Mona Lisa in my uh, reconstruction. Huh. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas if they would then start to be aware of this, this collectiveness that they're, they're uh, contributing to, mm -hmm. to uh, would they then start to photograph other mm -hmm. art mm -hmm. in that space? Would, mm -hmm. they, would they start to try to save something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that, that's a, that's an interesting thought that I've had, but, but I have kept in the last few years, I have kept to, to um, making static uh, sculptures also for the sake of actually like, uh, stopping. Yeah, freezing, freezing. <laughs> yeah, uh, 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 yeah, I think for me that has been important, but maybe in future I might also consider doing something that is constantly mm -hmm. evolving, mm -hmm. sort of, and where uh, uh, it was uh, like in real time you can see what the effects are of the images. So a really interesting feedback to the in your work between, between the representation of the art form of, of your processes and the individual. When you talk about this loop thing also, mm -hmm. I mean, that, that triggers individual behaviors. Do you know if anyone that have taken a photo that you used have seen these? Uh, well, I actually didn't know because uh, I was uh, uh, I was at the Swedish Institute in Paris mm -hmm. to, uh, to talk to Eva Kamlin, the director there, and uh, and I knew before because I have collected images, <laughs> so I knew that she had <laughs> taken a photo on that day. Have her, her I have okay. I have her photo, <laughs> <laughs> so I can uh, confront her. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, okay. I, I know. <laughs> I know this is <laughs> yeah. yeah, so She knows at least. <laughs> and she, how did she respond? Uh, uh, she was very interested in the work. She had a very long talk about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Me too. Have you been part of this? No. No, I didn't post on that on that day. It was uh, lived memories in a different way. But I was thinking of the the your first when I first met the work of Michaela was through this work at uh, the collective collection that was at the Young Swedish Forum, Ungsvensk Forum got the award and uh, uh, because it's the the space in Louvre where Mona Lisa or La Joconde. Uh, her real name, but it's Mona Lisa for everybody. Uh, and it, that uh, this space and the way that if uh, uh, when, the, when the audience decides what's important in a space and what does it become, it was, I was really fascinated by the question as well. And the little that was left of that space of the Louvre, uh, uh, which wasn't documented or which wouldn't exist, in a way, if it if if you take that, what's not seen and shared on internet is not seen or it doesn't exist. There's a lot of people, a lot of things that would just disappear. So, what is important? What is what is part of the important? What becomes public awareness and what becomes the collective memory when when decided by the public audience itself? So, maybe if you're a art historian, so maybe La Joconde or Mona Lisa is not the best painting at the Louvre, I don't know, but it's the most viewed painting at the Louvre. Uh, so what, what does it become? What, what is quality? What is quality in space or in public? 
it, it was very fascinating and I love the models because they were very imprecise. Uh, so it also, for, for, I'm back to the imagination uh, where Gordon Mata-Clark Mata is like a, a, like a surgeon uh, taking out spaces of a static environment. He takes out spaces like a surgeon and makes us look at them. And that also triggers imagination, but it's very precise. And then this is kind of add on and adding on so many layers that it that it becomes like flu. Uh, that it's uh, not not a clear country, uh, not a clear edge. <laughs> and uh, to me, it opens imagination to what is part of public space. That was what is that work on the collective uh, collection was about, I think. And this in Notre Dame, it's the same thing. What is what is value? What do we value? At the same time as the Notre Dame was burning, the Amazon forest was burning. Uh, if we look at what uh, it means to humankind, if we restore a building in the center of Paris, or if we take the same money and we put it into the Amazon forest, it would probably make a lot more sense on a global humankind level to take care of the forests in the Amazon than a building in the center of Paris. But that's not what mattered in the collective consciousness, which is which is also an inter it kind of evokes that question also. So it's uh, it's interesting on many levels. The, people didn't start imagining what can we do to save the the Amazon forest. There were not like a, a trillion architectural proposals, but for the building there was. What can it become? What is this public monument? What is this? space for collective spirituality in a way. Yeah, and also, I mean, I haven't seen the Mona Lisa room kind of models, but it sounds very interesting to me, and also because I think they evoke, they recognize and explore the other processes. Also, I mean, you have the monument here, here, here you have the cathedral, you have the Mona Lisa room, you have the Mona Lisa painting, both are monuments, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and there, it sounds to me like you also explore the process that surround these monuments. Uh, I mean, the people who decide not to take the pictures of the Mona Lisa, I mean, but mm -hmm. still, still they are part of the story in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the processes in certain, I mean, the, mon the process of the, of the monument, the surrounding processes also have a relationship, but, does, but still may, may become the Amazon forest, you know. They also recognize within within this network of kind of relationships where, when 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 things affect the monument. That's 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 interesting. Mm -hmm. um, why Paris? <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, that's a really fun question. Uh, it's not it's not so conscious uh, that I focus on Paris and not on my works, but. Um, what what is interesting to me uh, with this uh, kind of unofficial archive that I'm calling Korea uh, is is this um, situation when a lot of people I mean a lot of people decide to do more or less the same thing mm -hmm. uh, over time and uh, upload photos uh, makes this massive uh, data bases basically or image bases um, which become for me interesting to work with so if you if you flip that around um, basically it becomes interesting for me to work with things that are photographed a lot mm -hmm. uh, and then what is photographed a lot Paris <laughs> 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 it is kind of a thing that feeds itself yeah, currently talking about that. Yeah, it's the most, it's the largest, or it, be, be, before COVID, it was the largest tourist destination in the world. Mm -hmm. But it is also, I think, I, I did one uh, uh, small work uh, during COVID actually, um, which was of um, the Nike sculpture at the Louvre. Mm -hmm. uh, that was it was during the lockdown in France, so all the museums were closed and no one could even, was even allowed to walk outside. And still, people were sitting there in their homes, <laughs> uploading images of the sculpture. 
And then I thought, that's so beautiful that they're, you know, in their confinement, um, you know, dreaming of this public space that we used to have. <laughs> or like this, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like a semi-public space in the museum, but, but still, it's sort of dreaming of the world on the outside. So then I also made a work that was uh, using only images that were uploaded in the moment when it could, they couldn't have been at the museum. Just a little COVID uh, structure. <laughs> <laughs> the memory is too. Yeah. Wow, mm -hmm. that's nice. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few audience here that will watch on the discussion. We also have an audience here virtually. Uh, is there still? No, it, it was very nice to to hear from you because uh, as I never had the chance to come to Sweden, uh, I was also wondering what was the impact of Notre Dame's fire abroad. Uh, it seems to be um, uh, quite uh, difficult to 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 judge from from where we stand, and and I, I, as I spoke uh, already with Michaela, but. With the chance to 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 exchange exchange perspective as well, and and her work is very uh, precious. It's truly precious because it gives us insight uh, of what can be the uh, collective imagination uh, on on a building which just um, outstands uh, its uh, national value or its uh, historic value. Uh, it is something that, as as you say, Tava, it belongs to imagination and belongs to to the realm of fiction, uh, and 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 in, in, in collective uh, meaning, and so it is uh, truly very interesting to uh, to recollect all these uh, um, uh, considerations and reflection through your uh, uh, through your uh, lecture. So, Thema, thank you so much. Have you seen these uh, works uh, IRL, Simon? No. I, I, if I saw what, sorry, if I saw what? If you have seen these this, this works, uh, IRL. Only, only by pictures. Only by pictures, okay. Yeah. yeah. Sweden. Ship them down to you. Definitely, definitely. It'll be a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to know the relationship with structure and the wall pieces. Uh, the wall pieces uh, are, this is something that I'm still sort of exploring myself, so how, how I work with them. Um, from the start, they are kind of a side effect of the structures, actually. Um, uh, but then I have started to work with them as a kind of very, I, I see them as a kind of a new way of archiving almost. And new uh, capturing of, of something, um, but it is uh, it is for me also new what I'm doing with them. Say um, they are as the like, say like the easy answer <laughs> is that that they are the texture of the models that I get out. Um, so actually, that sculpture and that image belong together. Uh, because when I when I merge the, the images uh, in the photogrammetry, I get a shape and I get an image, and then sort of the computer knows <laughs> how to wrap this image around the shape, and it would have the window there on the window there. Um, but I found these images to be very also suggestive and quite um, quite interesting to work with visually. So like, remind me of how fragments of the mind would also be taken together. And so I started to work with them more uh, separately from my structures and to find them with those two also. But uh, yeah, I'm still exploring those. <laughs> but I think they, they give something to each other for sure. So I, I like to look at them. So this is basically a script for so this mm -hmm. more than like a yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean this isn't of course interesting. Any other questions? Uh, 
I mean, we've had a few exhibitors here at Axe Park who are working at this intersection between automation like photography and digital kind of uh, printing, different way to do paintings, and uh, more traditional craft, and, and how to think about these two processes uh, together and how the overlaps can become you know, kind of new ways forward and new ways of working with architecture and design. And, and I think you are also in that intersection, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, perhaps. Uh, I don't know if I would say that I'm in an in intersection with craft necessarily, but more. Mm, it's more that for me, these, these digital processes make it possible for me to. Uh, to reach my goal, <laughs> sort of, uh, which is this materialization of this uh, image base. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if I would place myself in, in the realm of craft. Maybe it's more maybe between animation and 38,000 people. <laughs> Collectiveness and But also, isn't there certain layers of handwork on these pieces? Mm -hmm. You talk about them. In oh, yes, for sure, for sure. Production. I just have this, uh, I have a conversation. Okay. But, uh, yes, of course. It is uh, for me, um, yes, for, for you who have not uh, visited, it's uh, difficult to know. Of course, from a distance, they have a very uh, digital uh, aesthetic. Uh, but when you come up close, uh, I've worked a lot with the surface treatments of them uh, to uh, like when you come up close there's um, you see sort of like brush strokes and, uh, and sanding strokes they're, they're hand handcrafted sort of uh, on the surface mm -hmm. uh, which was for me important because uh, because if I had kept them only the way they come out from the 3D printer I think uh, we would have lost a little bit this, uh, like the, the understanding that there's a lot of humans involved <laughs> in the process, let's say. So for me, this is also a way to, to make that more, like a, give a little human touch almost to the sculptures in the surface. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and also, I mean, no, too many Clement, you can't see this, but how about the there are, I mean, I was here with my colleagues days ago, had a meeting here, we were looking at the pieces and a lot of expertise in 3D printing and using a base and how you were <laughs> working with the spaces behind. I mean, it's just like you added these blobs towards the, I mean, physically, how, how do you do? <laughs> do you, yeah, do you, do you print this one in one piece or do you assemble no, it? No, they are printed in pieces. And, and you assemble it. Yeah, and then I work very, very long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With, uh, yeah that's, that's like a little misconception. As soon as someone hears that it's 3D printed, I think it's just like. Exactly. <laughs> and then I just send it to the 3D printer, which, um, which is really the fast part, uh, the, the printing uh, time. And then I, it is uh, a lot of, of uh, handwork. Yeah. I, I work for with these sculptures for maybe a month and a half, uh, only sanding and uh, and polishing and mm -hmm. uh, mounting them together. So it's a, a big part of the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what what I think about, or what I mean with intersecting craft mm -hmm. and automation is exactly the ability to have this kind of. Uh, vision of this kind of goal to work itself towards to them using the technologies at hand, that being a computer and through the printer or being a sandpaper, but still moving your process forward. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a beautiful aspect of the art work because it, it it feels very crafted still. Mm -hmm. You can also see that it's something else. Yeah. And that's true. Mm -hmm. the pieces. Uh, okay, we are running towards the end. <laughs>
Any other any comments uh, to them? Any thoughts you want to share? It's just that it's a lot of materiality because you talk about uh, 3D printing, but it's as you say when you when you work on them, there's a lot of materiality and a lot of kind of imaginative investment there again in in this. Uh, 3D printed objects that become something else because you put your hand and your into you kind of translate all these 38,000 people joined into one 3D printed thing, but then you reinterpret that in a way by by touching it and by making it uh, an object that is not just machine made. You put your interpretation onto that also. So I think that also makes it beautiful. There was one this. Kind of when you start looking into things, and I've been looking a lot into Notre Dame because this conversation was coming up, and then I got into a, a, a soundscape archaeologist that's called uh, apparently Mylène Pardoin. She she works to refound the sound, so we yeah the sounds of Notre Dame it sounded really interesting. And then I wanted to know: Do you work in other media? Then your it's three D sculptures. Have you thought of sound? as part of your work, because uh, it could add another dimension. So it's have, really fascinating. I have, uh, I have been, uh, and now I, I lose the name of this person, but there is uh, also a, a Swedish artist that is working with, uh, with sound uh, archiving, sort of, um, that uh, I've been meaning to contact actually about this. Um, and then I have also, talked with a, with a pianist that wants to work with uh, with sort of uh, sound uh, how would you say um, uh, composing um, to, uh, in combination with my sculptures so there is there is the idea yes I think that would be fantastic to to develop something with sound. That would really, I mean, always an experience with sound or without sound is a very different uh, experience. So I think that would be really nice. Mm -hmm. Because to me, sometimes seeing your sculptures, they may, I kind of imagine sound also. They're, as they're, they're very tactile and they don't speak only to vision. Mm -hmm. I think they're quite, they're, they're tactile and they speak to other senses than just vision. And so I was thinking of For sure. how you sort of working but maybe sound also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the kind I, of compositions. Yeah, this this uh, conversations with the pianist that started because I was working uh, in my studio, sanding them, <laughs> and uh, meanwhile listening to to music. And I just thought, like when I took out my headphones, it was such a different <laughs> experience. <laughs> so then uh, I contacted this uh, pianist that I know. A little we're working on it. <laughs> Looking forward. <laughs> Next phase. Yes. yes. Well, it's been a wonderful conversation. Uh, certainly around, I think, the architectural monument in communal processes and how that can be used as a vehicle of, of in interpretation of space transformation and space making. I think the exhibition has really been successful in that way. I mean, uh, I think the conversation here has really touched upon a lot of different aspects of that, so it's a pleasure being, being talking to you and it's been great to have you here. Thank we you. We look forward to the next sound, sound <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> to yes. add to the, yeah. to the destructive monuments. And of course thank you to, to Anna and Max and you for having me here. That's really great, thank you. Thank, to thank you so much for the Thank you for inv the invitation. It's been super interesting to talk to you about this. It was a fantastic conversation. Thanks to all the three of you for a nice afternoon. Thank you to the audience in real life. Thank you so much as well. Thank you for being here. Well, take care. And uh, so we see you on 9th of December for those ones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, take you. Take take care of you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Thank you again. Yeah.